again. We're continuing the sermon series on Daniel when Babylon is home. And Drew has read one of the famous passages in all of the Bible, the fiery burning furnace. It was the first president of Ghana who said these infamous words, Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all of the, all of the things shall be added unto you. These were both the words of the first president of the Republic of Ghana that stood on the inscription of his larger-than-life statue outside the capital city of Accra. The first president of Ghana could tolerate no disunity for the good of Mother Ghana. In Soviet Russia, in an outlying district, when the name Joseph Stalin was mentioned, everyone in the political assembly rose to their feet, enthusiastically began to applaud. In 1930s Russia, this was a perilous participation. Because who, after all, was going to be the first to sit down and stop applauding? An elderly politician eventually became so weary of standing that he took his seat. The officials promptly noted his name and arrested him the very next day. He had failed to worship the idol long enough. Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all other things shall be added unto you. Throughout history, this has often been the mantra and the message of political autocrats. Will you bow down? This has often been the question political elite rulers ask of the masses. And even today, even today in America, can't you see this? Can't you hear this? Politics has become America's new favorite pastime, replacing baseball. New favorite religion, replacing Christianity. In fact, the religious features <clears throat> of contemporary American politics is striking. I alone can save you, says politicians on both the right and the left. With any religion, a devil figure is needed. The opposition will play this part perfectly and will often get branded as such. Either they are the next embodiment of Adolf Hitler, the new modern face of the KKK, or the American equivalent of Fidel Castro. Any devil figure will do. Politics provides transcendence for our small lives, peddles hope in hopeless times, traffics in apocalyptic scenarios if our legislation does not get accepted, and gladly accepts adoring worshipers, especially at rallies. All the trappings of a new religious movement are here. And yet yeah, it was a wise man in Jerusalem that once told us there is nothing new under the sun. Total allegiance to the state or total allegiance to political rulers is surely not a modern phenomenon. Such was the case in 6th century B.C. in Babylon during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar as he sets up an enormous golden statue on the outskirts of the city. This morning I want to go back to a small detail to begin that I saved in my back pocket, as it were, from Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, indicates that King Nebuchadnezzar brought the sacred objects and vessels from the temple of Jerusalem to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. So you might have wondered, as I did, where exactly is the land of Shinar? Well, this occurs in modern-day Iraq. But you can also ask, what else happened in Shinar in the Bible? One of the first times that Shinar is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 11. Certain folks came together in the land of Shinar and said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower, with a top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. This was the Tower of Babel in the land of Shinar. 
So all the evidence points to the fact that the infamous Tower of Babel and Babylon, the infamous city, were located in the exact same place. And in the Bible, Babylon always represents a sinister, evil force opposing the people of God. Babylon always has dreams of grandeur, of making a name for itself in the land of Shinar. And even though in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar praises Daniel for telling him and then interpreting his dream. Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. Daniel had said something to Nebuchadnezzar that disturbed him. Namely, after you, another kingdom will arise. It was the after you part that disturbed the royal ego of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar builds a lasting monument. Now, not only the head is of gold, but the entire statue is of gold. Ninety feet tall, nine feet wide, a defiant tribute to a very troubling dream. Nebuchadnezzar is not about to go down without an autocratic fight. So, he, so that really sets up the scene today in Daniel chapter 3, which allows us to look at this story from three different angles. First, the humor and the haughtiness of idolatry. The, def, uh, the definition of haughty people, according to the dictionary, are disdainful, overbearing, prideful, and obnoxious people. So, in verse 2, Nebuchadnezzar is sent to gather all the people, all the government officials, to come to this grand celebration to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And so there's haughtiness. There's a certain amount of arrogance in the pomp and circumstance. But there's also humor just under the surface of this story as this Jewish author tells it. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar made an image. That is clear from verse 1. But then in verse 15, the same word, similar phrase appears again. Made an image. Excuse me. Nebuchadnezzar asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are you going to fall down and worship the image that I have made? This is a humorous statement of theological insanity. Daniel doesn't care how powerful a king you are, how dominant your empire is, how shimmery your golden statue shines, how large and impressive your stature is, over 15 times the size of an average man. Here's the humor in it all. You made it. You made it, Nebuchadnezzar. And now you require worship? But again, you made it. Second of all, humor is found in the nine times that the author uses the words set up. It's found in verse 1. And then it's found in verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar invites all the people to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And again in verse 3, all the providence gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then again in verse 7, all the peoples and nations and language fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So think about it for a moment. The whole world, in a sense, is bowing down before this big statue. Perhaps the curse of Babel has finally been reversed. But nine times in the first 18 verses, this statue had literally been set up. So the author is trying to woo you, trying to, uh, you know, under the surface, say to you, don't you get the humor? All these people are bowing before an image that was set up. Third, humor is found in the sarcastic repetition 
of the pomp and circumstance of the Babylonian court. In verse 2, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province. And then again in verse 3, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence. And then also the sarcastic repetition of the pomp and circumstance of all the musical instruments of the Babylonian court. Look at verse 5. When you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, who knew this didn't originate in Scotland, right? And every kind of music, you are to fall down. And then it happened just the way that Nebuchadnezzar would have liked. As soon as all the peoples heard, in verse 7, the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, everyone fell down and worshipped the golden image. It is theologically ridiculous. Everyone worshipped? flat on their faces as soon as the music played to the God that Nebuchadnezzar had set up to the image made by a mere human. The hollowness and the humor come blazing through this text. Reminds me of the story in 1938. Adolf Hitler is paying a visit to his good buddy on the Mediterranean coast, on the Mediterranean Sea, Mussolini, in Italy. As Mussolini trotted out various displays of military might, the Italian populace displayed what you might have called a rather cold indifference to the German chancellor. So much so that during a visit to Florence, it became clear to most everyone present that the cheers and crowd noise for Hitler was really nothing more than the amplification from loudspeakers of an old Italian movie. Great power, real emptiness. Great power, and yet hollow rhetoric. Great power can often go hand in hand with ridiculous worship. Daniel is exposing here in chapter 3 the sheer weight of ridiculous false worship. Anytime you bow down, anytime you bend the knee to anything that is not the true God, you are playing the fool. You are the jester in the court of fools. Anytime that you live in such a way that your screen is your God, that your success is your God, that your work is your God, that your portfolio is your God, that your health is your God, then you are participating in the ridiculous theology that is idolatry. Anytime that you even put God-given gifts above the worship of the true God, the gift of family, which is a gift of God, the gift of work, which is also a gift of God, The gift of marriage, which is a gift of God. Anytime you even put the gifts of God over the worship of God, we are being fools participating in this mindless, humorous worship of idolatry. Second, from the hollow and humorous idolatry to the grounded and gutsy face, faith of three teenagers, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The threat is real. The consequences are clear. Look at verse 15. It says this, But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So here are three teenagers sent not to a secular state university with all the normal, worldly temptations, but three teenagers ripped from their homeland by a mighty empire. Even the great Martin Luther needed a night to consider whether he would recant his writings during the Protestant Reformation. Yet, these three teenagers could say automatically 
They could say swiftly what they believed, who they were. They could identify the threat of idolatry and the delight of only offering true worship to Yahweh. How did they do this? Evidence points to the reality that Daniel and his three friends were actually children, were kids during a time of religious renewal in Jerusalem under King Josiah, when the Jews rediscovered the Word of God, when again the priests began to teach very faithfully the Word of God. And so these three teenagers grew up listening, and they grew up participating as the Word is being taught week in and week out. So that's how they knew what they knew. But what did they know? They knew the word of God. And they were able to stake their lives upon it. They stood very simply on the powerful, life-transforming word of God. Exodus chapter 20, the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. They knew the word. They stood on the word. They practiced the word. The word had become to them sweeter than honey, more precious than gold. And following the God of the word delighted their souls more than 10,000 threats from King Nebuchadnezzar, more than the threat of the burning, fiery furnace. They would have embraced what the Apostle Paul says in Genesis, or in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, when he says, For I am, for am, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. These three teenagers had been prepared through the word of God for a time such as this. Look what they say in verse 16. O King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. They knew God's power. They knew God's ability. They knew the God of the Exodus, the God who delivers and rescues and redeems his people. <coughs> the stories of the patriarchs, the stories of Moses were not these faraway, distant realities, but rather the very building blocks of their lives and their faith and their identity. They knew how to identify compromise. They knew how to identify the faithfulness of God. They knew that God was powerful. They knew that he delivers. <coughs> and they know how to identify sin and practice righteousness. But then look at verse 18. They say, but if not, but if not, these three believers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't the type of believers prone to mistaken faith for what we might call today toxic positivity. Now, toxic positivity, if you've never heard this term before, is defined by psychologists as the excessive and ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic, emotional state. Toxic positivity invalidates real emotions, minimizes real trials, and downplays and denies the full human range of human emotions. In the church of today, toxic positivity can often sound like this. God won't let you fail. If you just have faith, delete negativity from your life. Just speak and just think of positive things. And positive things will happen in your life. Friends, this is Oprah. This is the Word of Faith movement. This is Joel Olstein. This is not the Word of God. Nor is it the Word that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spoke to the king. They did not say to King Neb, 
I have faith in my faith. And I'm going to speak into existence God's help and protection. They do not practice toxic positivity cloaked in the language of faith. But rather they acknowledge all of God's attributes. They acknowledge both the power of God, but they also acknowledge the freedom of God. In verse 17, they acknowledge the power of God. God is able. God is always able. God is always able to deliver us. But then in verse 18, they acknowledge the freedom of God. But if not, the NIV translates it, but even if he does not, do you get what they're saying? But even if he does not deliver us, make it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Even if he does not deliver me, even if God does not make my life easy, even if I suffer disappointments in life, even if he doesn't heal my loved one, even if the church lets me down, even if we are bound hand and foot and thrown into a burning fiery furnace because we simply want to obey a commandment, still we will obey our God. We respect the freedom of God even as we believe in the power of God to deliver so these three young teenagers knew the attributes of God. They knew the commandments of God. They knew that better in your one is one day in your courts, O oh God, than practicing, in practicing obedience than a thousand days outside your courts bowing down to the false idols of Babylon. And so first, the haughtiness and humor of idolatry. Second, the grounded and gutsy face of faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The third point is this. We find the presence and the promise of God in the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. Did we not? Did we not cast three men into the fire? True, O king. But I see four men unbounded walking in the midst of the fire. And the fourth is like the son of the gods. Is this an angel? Is this Christ himself, which I think likely? Whatever the case, this is the God of Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When Isaiah writes, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. God did not deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire, but rather through it. God did not keep them from the burning fiery furnace, but found them in the midst of their trial. You see, nothing can keep this fourth man from his people. Not fiery furnaces, not sicknesses and operating rooms, not the early death of a loved one or the empty house after a death, not wayward children that aren't turning out like you hoped they would have turned out, not a painful divorce. Nothing can keep this fourth man from finding you in the very midst of the fire, in the very midst of the trial. And so don't we often wonder, I wonder if God could do this for me. I'd totally live for God. I'd totally obey the commandments of God. If God could send forth an angel or Christ himself to, to walk with me through the burning, fiery furnace, what if God could be unmistakably present to me? What if God could come down in my hurt and walk and alongside my, my life and my fires and my sin. Don't you know, friends, that you have a God who has walked with you in the fire. God is called Emmanuel, God with us. Christ has come down, suffered the fire for you, walked in the fire for you. So Nebuchadnezzar says it right. 
There is no other God. There is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. So we don't skip the fires. We always aren't shielded from Babylon. But the promises of God and the presence of God reaches us in every single fire. That is the hope and that is the promise in Daniel chapter 3. Let's pray.